All right, so here are the derivatives of the inverse trigonometric functions. So the inverse trig functions are written with two different notations. So the inverse symbol, so the derivative with respect to x of sine inverse, so it looks like it's raised to the negative 1 power of x, which is the same as the derivative with respect to x of arc sine of x. So this notation up here is the same as the arc sine notation. So they both mean the inverse of the trig function. And the derivative of this is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of cosine inverse, or the derivative of arc cosine, is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So hopefully you're seeing that pattern between sine and cosine. The derivative of the sine function is positive cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. And look how the derivative of arc sine is positive 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, and the derivative of arc cosine is negative the same thing. So negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of tan inverse, or arc tangent, is 1 over x squared plus 1, which is the same as, and you'll also see it written as, 1 over 1 plus x squared, because addition is commutative, so we can switch the two terms in the denominator. And even though there are six trig functions, so there are six uh, inverse trig functions, so six derivatives of inverse trig functions, these three on the left are the ones that I'm asking you to commit to memory. So not to say that the ones on the right aren't as important, but they don't quite show up as much. So we'll take a look at them. The derivative of cotangent inverse, or arc cotangent, well, that's just negative 1 over x squared plus 1. So if we know the derivative of arc tangent, well, or arc cotangent is negative of that exact same thing. And then the derivative of arc secant and arc cosecant, well, they're the exact same thing, except arc cosecant is negative. So again, anything that starts with a co is negative, just like the derivatives of the original trig functions. And in fact, the derivative of arc secant x is almost the same as the derivative of arc sine x, except that there is this absolute value of x added to the denominator. So 1 over absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1. And then our cosecant, the same thing, but a negative uh, being multiplied by. So these are the derivatives of the inverse trig functions. These three on the left, you do have to commit to memory. And the one that comes up most often, especially in the future when we get to integration, is this arctangent derivative. So this one is really important, but you do need to know the three on the left. All right, so in these next three examples, we're going to be looking at chain rules involving the derivatives of inverse trig functions. So in this first example, the derivative with respect to x of sine inverse of 7x. So sine inverse of 7x, I have 7x inside of sine inverse. And towards the end of this lesson, I'm going to give you some general formulas for this, but I really want to try to break down where those formulas come from. So the chain rule says we take the derivative of the outside function while leaving the inside the same. So the derivative of sine inverse we just learned was 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. But instead of the x, I'm going to go ahead and write this set of parentheses because the chain rule says that we write the inside function inside where that x would normally be of the derivative of the outside function. So 1 minus the quantity 7x squared. And then the chain rule says to take the derivative of the inside and multiply. So this whole thing times the derivative of 7x is just 7. So 7 is really 7 over 1. So the 7 can really be written on the top of this fraction. So 1 times 7 is 7, so that's going to go in the numerator, over the square root of 1 minus. So now 7x is a quantity squared is 49x squared. So this uh, power as exponent does distribute to both because this is multiplication inside. So 1 minus 49x squared. And I want to make sure that my square root does cover um, this entire difference. So it does span the whole quantity 1 minus 49x squared. And that's really all we can do to simplify. So one of the biggest mistakes students are going to make is to think that I could take the square root of each of these pieces separately. So just to clarify, 
one, the square root of one minus 49 x squared is not, definitely not the same as the square root of one minus the square root of 49 x squared. So a lot of students will say, oh, this is one minus seven x. That is absolutely not true. So the only way uh, a square root uh, does distribute is over multiplication or division. So the square root of, let's say, four, x squared. So this is multiplication here, not subtraction or addition. So this is the square root of 4, the square root of x squared. But it does not, the square root does not distribute over addition or subtraction. So now let's take a look at the next one. I have the derivative of arc cosine of e to the x. So this is another composition of functions. I have e to the x inside arc cosine. So the derivative of arc cosine is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. But instead of the x, I'm going to put that inside function. I'm going to put e to the x. And then the chain rule says I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is e to the x. So again, this is like e to the x over 1. So it's really like putting the derivative on the top. So negative 1 times e to the x is negative e to the x all over, and in the denominator, I'm going to go ahead and write it as square root of 1 minus e to the 2x. So my properties of exponents here say that this x and this 2 multiply. So 1 minus e to the 2x, and that's all we can do to simplify. We're going to leave our answer like this. So now finally, we'll do an example of arctangent. So arctangent of the natural log of x. So now here, the derivative of the outside function, arctangent, is 1 over 1 plus x squared. But instead of the x, I'm going to put the inside function, ln of x, and then I multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. So now, in this case, I'm multiplying by 1 over x, which is already a fraction here. So the x is really going to stay on the bottom. So 1 times 1 gives me a 1 in the numerator. And then over, and now here's where I want to be careful. x is one whole thing, and 1 plus ln x squared is another whole thing. So I want to make sure and put parentheses around the quantity 1 plus the natural log of x squared. So ln x is being squared, and I have to keep parentheses around ln x because ln x squared is not the same as parentheses natural log of x squared. If I don't put the parentheses, now it only looks like the x is being squared, but it's the whole quantity squared. So my final answer is 1 over x times 1 plus the natural log of x in parentheses squared, and that whole 1 plus ln x squared has to be in parentheses as well. So this is my final answer. All right, so now what I want to do is combine derivatives of inverse trig functions with other rules that we have. So this derivative would require a quotient rule. So I have x squared divided by arctangent x. So here the quotient rule tells me that this derivative is the bottom function, so low arctangent x, d high, so the derivative of x squared is times 2x minus high, so x squared, d low. So I need to multiply by the derivative of arctangent x. So the derivative of arctangent x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. And then all over the bottom squared. So arctangent x quantity squared. And now let's see if I can do anything to simplify this. So here, I'm going to go ahead and bring the 2x to the front and leave this as 2x arctangent x minus, so now here, a couple things. So this x squared is really an x squared over 1. But one of the biggest mistakes, again, is for students to think that this x squared and this x squared cancel, and they don't. So just to kind of pull this piece off to the side, if I have x squared over 1 times 1 over 1 plus x squared, this x squared and this x squared do not cancel. The only way that would happen is if everything here is being multiplied and divided. But this 1 plus prevents that from happening. So the only thing I can do is rewrite this as x squared, so x squared times 1, and then 1 times the denominator, 
is 1 plus x squared. And there's really not much more that I can really do with that. So this is going to be x squared over 1 plus x squared. And then all over arctangent x quantity squared. Now, I wouldn't really want to leave a fraction inside of a fraction. But in this case, uh, the least common denominator in the numerator would be 1 plus x squared, and I'd have to find common denominators. And it actually wouldn't make this thing look that much nicer. So we're just going to go ahead and leave the answer like this. So we're not going to simplify it all the way down to just one fraction. We're just going to leave this fraction of x squared over 1 plus x squared inside of this bigger fraction. All right, this next example, the derivative with respect to x of x times sine inverse of x. So here, I have to use a product rule. x is one function, sine inverse of x is another. Now, I wrote the question this way on purpose because I want to talk about one of the biggest mistakes students make that is a clear misunderstanding of inverse trig functions. Sine inverse of x, so I'm going to pull it off to the side, sine inverse of x cannot ever be rewritten as 1 over sine x. So I understand your temptation for wanting to move this down to the bottom because this is a negative exponent, but that's not what this notation means, and I understand that to be tricky. But the only way that works is if I have a single variable raised to a numerical exponent. So this variable represents a number. So in other words, if I have 2 to the negative 1, that is 1 over 2. But here, this is an entire function. So this is sine inverse of x. So I can't think about it as sine x as a quantity to the negative 1. So that's not true. That's not how this inverse notation works. And that's why, in fact, mathematicians came up with the arc notation instead. So that's why we use arc sine of x predominantly for inverse trig functions because this relationship does not work. So in this problem, students are tempted to rewrite this as x over sine x, which would be a terrible mistake. And finding the derivative of this using a quotient rule would not work because sine inverse of x is not the same as 1 over sine x. So a lot of students are going to try that because they forget the derivative of sine inverse of x. But this trick will not work. It is not a property of inverse trig functions. So here, the product rule would have us take the first function x times the derivative of the second function. So the derivative of sine inverse is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared plus the second function sine inverse of x times the derivative of the first, the derivative of x is 1. And I can't do much here, I'm just going to put the x on top. So x over the square root of 1 minus x squared plus sine inverse x. And that's really all I can do to find the derivative of this product of functions. All right, so the last thing I want to take a look at is the general formula for derivatives of inverse trig functions with the chain rule. So sometimes, again, students struggle with applying the chain rule to the inverse trig function. So here is a generic way of thinking about it. If I have the derivative of arc sine of f of x, so here's the inside function f of x, the derivative can be thought of as taking that f of x and substituting it into where the x would normally go, so the square root of 1 minus the quantity f of x squared, and then the derivative of the inside is going to end up going on the top because typically with the chain rule we'd multiply by the derivative, but that's the same as putting it in the numerator of the derivative. And so the arc cosine function works the same way except that now the top is negative. So again, we take the inside function f of x, we put it where the x would be, multiply by the derivative of f of x, and that would go on the top where the negative 1 normally was. And then the derivative of arc tangent f of x. So we put the f of x where the x would have gone. 1 plus x squared is now 1 plus f of x squared. And the derivative of f of x on the top. So f prime of x in the numerator. So if you have a hard time applying the chain rule, then maybe this is another collection of derivatives that's worth memorizing. Um, but ultimately, that's all we're really doing is applying the chain rule to the inverse trig function. So these aren't necessary to memorize if you really understand the chain rule.